today. They will be sharing with us, and the presentation is entitled Beyond Data, and is led by Professor Wendy Kilfoyle. Let us welcome them to the presentation. Thank you. Uh, I'm the project manager for the um, Sia Pumalela grant at the University of Pretoria. And I have with me today co-presenting three students, two uh, final year faculty of education students and one um, honours student from humanities. Um, they will introduce themselves. They're all SRC members holding different portfolios. So um, it's a, a easy for me, an easy selection because then I just ask the SRC to give me people rather than running around three or 4,000, 400,000 students, however many we've got. Um, and trying to find students. So I'm very grateful to them for agreeing to participate today. Uh, for me, this photo um, is so inspirational. I always think that the graduation is what the university is about. That's the, the output, the outcome for students. It's about student success. And this fellow is so happy. He is radiating happiness. He's radiating triumph with a cell phone in his hand. I don't know if he had it on the whole time he was on the stage. One of the people who was doing the capping said one of the students did take a selfie with him <laughs> on the, while on the stage. Uh, but it's just so much part of student life. But I, I don't even know what faculty this chap's in. I don't know what his student number is. I don't know his name. I don't know his APS score. I don't know if he's finished in minimum time. I know nothing about this fellow, but I do know that he has succeeded, and he's triumphant, and it's fantastic, and that's what the university should be about. There are a whole lot of data myths, I think, going around that data tells us all we need to know about the students, um, that only quantitative data are valuable or reliable, uh, that student success data in terms of marks um, are all that count, and I can tell you one thing, I'm incredibly suspicious of aggregated data. I don't think it tells us anything about the interventions we need to put in place for individual students. Then cognitive ability as evidenced by Marx is all that counts in student success and that the quality of input equals the quality of output. And I think we need to um, rid our minds of these myths. Now it's not that we are not paying attention to the normal kind of data at the University of Pretoria in line with um, the uh, Siapum Lela contract. So we have what you heard from Professor Duncan yesterday, uh, the SEBI Data Analytics Committee. Uh, we looked for a name for this committee and SEBI actually means something like a gossiper. Somebody who listens to everything, gets all the information and then shares it with other people. So uh, this is a, a data analytics committee. Uh, we do look at the aggregated data from uh, the HEMIS and the HEDA system. Um, and we look at the Blackboard Analytics data, which is more formative, whereas the HEMIS data is all after the fact they've now failed. You've got to do something about it. So one of the different things we're doing this year, last year during one of the presentations, and this committee's been going for a couple of years already, was at one presentation, one of the deputy deans said to Dr. Lemons, who, had been, uh, who was doing um, some presentation, I need a tutorial to understand this. And then, in fact, we took his presentation and we turned it into tutorial. It's taking a long time, it's taking like six months, because we always like high-end products, the culture of the University of Pretoria, so it's scripting and videoing and so on. Whereas, in fact, I think what we need to do is sit there when people are doing the presentation with a really good mic, capture everything, record everything, and just put it up as a PDF with an accompanying audio file. At least we've got the resources, because we are doing so much in that committee um, so much learning and training, and it's gone. It's not a resource for anybody coming um, after us. So I think that is something we might need to have a look at. But what we've done subsequently this year um, in the SEBI committee is in fact have a session each time from our HEMIS uh, people, from our institutional research people, on the HEDA um, dashboards. So they show how you can get into the dashboards, what you can do on the dashboards, and it's an interactive system. You can change the parameters. You can produce your own dashboards. And then we made the um, deputy deans go away and look at their HEDA dashboards and come back and do a presentation to us on what they'd learned from the HEDA dashboards. So, and that's been very valuable. 
And also we are doing a roadshow, Professor Duncan and myself and the head of the Institutional Research um, Department. And he's bringing up every time at the end of that presentation for the teaching learning committees and the faculties that they can ask him to come and do a presentation to their faculty on the HEDA dashboards and request permission, individual people can request permission um, to have access to the HEDA dashboards. So we're really trying to promote data in that way and um, trying to capture and, and train and really build capacity. But it's taken us a few years to get to this realization point that we need to um, do this kind of thing. But what we're also looking at, and Professor Duncan always says, um, what do the successful students do? You know, we pay so much attention to the students who are failing. What do the successful students do? And that is what our uh, three students are, are coming here to talk to us about today. But we're also having a look at growth mindsets. We've got a big research project running on student well-being um, and resilience. Uh, the data isn't available yet. It's still being processed, but at some stage um, we will um, bring it to one or the other conference. What I'm going to um, focus on before the students talk about um, the reasons why they're successful is dispelling this myth that the um, APS score should be the predictor of um, university success. There's an entire field of neuroscience related to learning nowadays and, and uh, neuropsychology and so on. But the neuroscience um, tells us that there's such a thing as brain plasticity. And it actually doesn't matter what age you are, your brain has the ability to build new neural pathways, to learn in fact. And that we're not in fact taking enough cognizance of this um, when we are teaching. And what Professor Ballam said earlier really um, sort of struck a chord with me because if what students come up with is an APS and, and predicts how they're going to graduate, we're not teaching. We're not teaching properly. Uh, we're not facilitating learning because the brain can learn because of this brain plasticity thing. I just want to see if I can get this little video to play. Uh, the, the whole point about this is about the brain plasticity. Uh, don't worry about it. It's a very short little thing. Um, the growth mindset, if you care to go and read um, Dweck, and a couple of people have talked about growth mindset in the course of the conference already. Um, we actually need consciously to teach students that they can. Okay? So the brain is wired to learn, so everyone can learn through hard work and through the help of others. It's not about intelligence. It's about actually working and getting your brain activated to do the work. Okay, that a disadvantaged background is not a fixed self-fulfilling prophecy because your brain can learn. Uh, we can teach the students that they must accept responsibility for using available university resources. Everyone was saying yesterday, how do we tell them we've got these resources? Well, I think we tell them, but they don't really listen. Um, it's not salient to them at the time we're telling them, I think. Um, that they should avoid a fixed mindset um, in which they blame factors over which they have no control. Um, that they should work towards resilience, adaptability, innovation, and persistence in adversity. And that happy people deal better with adversity. So in January, with the or, or, you know, end of January, beginning of February, with the orientation program, in the Faculty of um, Natural and Agricultural Sciences in Mathematics, they um, did a mindset workshop with the students. And I just love this student whose brain freezed when she thought about having to do mathematics. And it's the self-efficacy thing, self-efficacy being um, your confidence in your ability to handle a particular thing like mathematics. Um, and what I also love about this is she had heard a metaphor earlier and not really reacted to it. So the metaphor was about these two wolves, this bad wolf and the good wolf. And the wolf that you feed grows. So if you feed your lack of eff efficacy and your fear and these weaknesses, then that is what grows. But if you feed your strengths and you have believe that you can learn, then that is what will grow. So I think it's a really telling quotation from this student. Uh, we have incorporated the entire idea of the growth mindset into our FLY campaign, which you've heard so much about. Um, so this is one of the chaps from House Humanities having his photos taken. You remember those fat ladies on the beach? You always had 
<laughs> in the olden days, maybe you, some of you too young, because my grandmother used to have photos like that. They used to put their head into a little thing with a bathing costume on and so on. Well, this is now I believe. Right? You have your photograph taken with I believe I can do this, and this becomes a sort of a, a motivator for them. So that's what we're doing with the students. But it's also very important to change the understanding of academics about the students. So again, an example from Natural and Agricultural Sciences where the education consultant in a low did a, a workshop with the lecturers to talk about growth mindsets so that you, you get it coming from all sides, that everyone understands that the students should be able to learn. So you actually have to change the lecturer's mindset as well. So we've heard already about this looking to the left and looking to the right. It's a real university myth as well, <laughs> legend, what they call urban legends. Um, that doesn't motivate people, right? And if you believe that it's going to improve your students' performance by giving them a real scare, when neuroscience shows you that high levels of stress are detrimental to learning, um, when you think that high failure rates um, reflect high standards and not poor teaching, and when in fact you play this whole blame game, it's the school's fault, it's the student's fault. Okay, so these are the kinds of lecturer mindsets we have to change and make lecturers realize that every student sitting in front of them has the potential to learn and improve. Now, effectively, if you're seeing this, and this is just fictional data, if you're seeing this at your university, that if they come in with a certain band, say in a 30 to, or 28 to whatever band, um, that they've got 40% of graduating minimum time or succeeding at the end of the first semester or the end of the first year, but the ones in the 42 have got an 80% chance, then in my opinion, um, there's no evidence of good teaching there and um, there's actually no evidence of an understanding of brain plasticity, that if we're teaching, we should, teaching well, we should be able to change um, the students' outcomes. Uh, neuroscience will tell you a great deal about how to improve memory and what they're saying there is to adopt a healthy, balanced lifestyle. New information is important, but our minds are not filing cabinets and too many people treat um, students as if their minds were filing cabinets. And it's actually not what goes in, but what comes out and how often it comes out and how meaningful the context is in which it comes out. Um, and this is called memory retrieval. You can go and have a look at it, it's very interesting. So the flipped classroom, for example, which many of you might use, um, is based on this kind of a concept that before students come to class, they read, they watch a video, they do a little quiz. And when they come to class, they do these concept tests where you require them, again, they've, they've read, the video, you know, read the text or done the video and then taken the information out for the quiz and they come to class and there's another concept test. So they've got to get the information out again, they've got to talk to their fellow students about it, which is uh, Ms. Yoko's peer learning. Um, and then there will be follow-up activities in which they've got to get the information out again. And it is this building of neural pathways that creates um, memories rather than sitting with the book and putting it all into the filing cabinet, taking it out for the exam, and then it's gone. No neural pathway was created. Then we have to pay attention to cognitive ability and emotional resilience. Moderate levels of stress are in fact necessary to learn, but not being scared out of your wits. Um, and that learning is not all in your head, that food is important. This poor student who had to make a decision about do I eat today or do I eat tomorrow? Um, no, I won't eat today, I'll go into the, that exam without having eaten, when in fact your brain is a very selfish organ, it takes most of the nutrition from your food. So by depriving your brain of that nutrition, you're likely to be less successful as she pointed out. Exercise is important. Um, sleep and then engagement in life and your surroundings. So there's so much that neuroscience is telling us about what we should be looking at um, in terms of student success and that you can't reduce students to aggregated data. You've got to actually have a look at them individually. So part of what we're looking at, as I said, is also besides the, the, the um, growth mindset, um, is what do successful students do? Okay, so I want to introduce you to um, three bright young people who are now successful students at the University of Pretoria. Um, they're going to talk in this order. And so, but Ken, can I ask you to 
come up and start the ball rolling. And he says he's nervous, but I don't think he actually is because he's a very confident young man. <laughs> Mic check, yeah. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, greetings to the house at large. My name is Obagen Sebeng. I'm doing education at the University of Pretoria final year this year. I'm currently serving on the SRC, holding the portfolio of societies. So I would like to provide a brief overview of my academic life and background. Um, it all started in 2003 when I officially entered the formal education system. And throughout my primary school years, I was a top student um, where I used to school. However, because of the community and neighborhood I was from was depriving me of many opportunities. Um, I recall one day in 2008 and 2009, I was invited to, uh, to a student exchange program to, the Washington, yeah, to Washington DC at the USA. But um, when they got the letter at home, the whole family was excited, my mom was excited, but deep down I knew it was not gonna happen. So one can ask, why did you know it was not gonna happen, and especially at a very young age? So I knew that, firstly, we couldn't afford for me to even go um, to the United States, let alone the lifestyle that side and was not. So I had to you, um, lose on that opportunity for the student exchange. But however, that did not discourage me. It made me realize that I have potential. Um, as a, a learner from a township school, being invited all the way from the USA. Um, if and only if I had funding, I would have taken that opportunity with both hands. So I still maintained my academic performance through secondary school level, and my mom, who's a single parent, was my cheerleader along the way. So in 2011, I was offered an opportunity once more to be assessed for an ISASA scholarship or bursary. So this allowed students from previously disadvantaged communities to write a test, and based on your results, they will offer you a scholarship to study at one of the world-class boarding schools in the country. So I had to go write the test in Amanskral. I'm from Mabopani, so I need to take two taxis to go to Amanskral and two taxis to go back home. But it was during the month I'm single parent, not working, and there's no money for me to go to Amanskral to write the test. But knowing my mom, she made a plan somehow, and I was able to go to Amanskral and, and go and write that test. But unfortunately, I was not selected. They took the best, the top students, whoever. And also, another opportunity missed out. Then the following year, uh, I changed schools, secondary schools. I went um, to another school. But one can say I went from a bad school to a worse school. So I regretted why I even changed schools. So fortunate enough, the school got an invitation from the University of Pretoria to implement a program called the Up With Science program. Um, so the school did not care much about that program. So I had to do a lot of inquiring, like say, what is this program all about and what's not. But all those teachers sent me from pillar to post. So I took the liberty to go to a public phone and to contact the project manager because on the poster, it had the contact numbers and the emails. So I didn't have an email then. So I called the lady. Thanks God I made that call. Uh, I called on a Thursday and the application was closing on a Friday. And I, I pleaded with the manager that on Friday I'm going to school. Can I come on Saturday to submit my application? And, that, and she did agree. Ah, another thing, transport money to go to Hatfield from our bunny is two taxis and then two taxis back. So I think I had 20 rents on me, so I had to take a metro rail train. It is cheap, so I was like, okay, let me just take the train. So I took, it was my first time using such uh, transport. Train has numbers, like it's a 95 or 96. If you get into a wrong one, you go into a wrong station. But I don't know what motivated me to go to Hatfield all of a sudden. Anyways, I was in the wrong train. I had to go, get off at Marabastad. Had to walk one hour to Hatfield to submit my application. Anyway, I, I got to the University of Pretoria. I submitted the application. Four weeks later, I was accepted to be part of the program. So the program runs for three years from grade 10 until grade 12. And after that, they, are, they award you with a bursary that only pays tuition. 
and the program wanted to motivate students or learners um, in the science field. So I was doing medicine science, I, I had to do BSc after metric, so everything was set according. But I, I, I didn't love science. So when I applied, I didn't apply for those BSCs. I applied for education, I, I wanna be a teacher. So I applied for teaching, FEDS, UJ, UP, but I, wanna be, I want to come to UP because I love Pretoria. I don't see myself going outside my hometown. So I, um, I got accepted and I moved into RES. Then I'm doing education and the contract for the program says you must do a BSc degree. So I had to make one of the emotional calls that day. I called the Bazari manager and I called him like Helga. Unfortunately, I will have to miss out on the scholarship or Bazari because I'm studying education. Um, little did I know that on the contract, there was a clause, there was a clause that um, the Bazari can be awarded to a student if the project manager can motivate to the dean or to the funders of the Bazari. Because I was a diligent student, I was, I was eager to learn during the times that we met. We met every month at Hatfield. So I was, I was eager to, to go to meet and to learn new things, um, interact with professors and lectures. So she made the things Helga and <laughs> luckily enough, the, I was awarded the bursary. However, it only paid tuition. So my only hope was, hey, maybe NFSAS will reply and it will pay for other things. So I can say that, and yeah, NFSAS did reply, so other things were sorted, and I also had the buzzer that pays the tuition. So studying is really expensive, staying in res and studying, NFSAS is not enough. You have a deficit of funds, you, you owe the university money. But I can say um, I was one of the lucky few students who did not have a Jew by you. So the, the system says Jew to you, or Jew by you. So I was one of the fortunate students who didn't have Jew by you. And yeah, so tuition was paid, rest was paid, books were paid, and I had a meal card. So now that I'm in SRC and I'm exposed to a lot of students, I can see, that's why I'm saying I'm one of the lucky few students. Um, students come to our offices with outstanding fees, with exclusions, they have accommodation crisis. Early January we have you know, uh, queues of people wanting to be admitted to the university at last minute. And this makes me to, to want to work hard, to inspire more. That's why I'm a teacher. I want to be a teacher, to tell my learners that it doesn't matter where you come from. If you believe in something, then you can do it. So through this whole experience and being at the university studying something that I really like, um, I've never even carried the module because it, it's something close to my heart. So I think if I did those BSCs, I would have I would have carried modules or being in 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 a position of being excluded. So I've learned that life in life you need to treat it as a bouncing ball, and then if it throws you a lemon, you do lemon juice. Um, so one quote that I would like to leave the house with is that you can do anyone else can do but only you can do it better. So Pindila will be next. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, amongst great minds, hi. <laughs> My name is Pindila Makomboti, and like Obakeng, I'm also from the lower working class um, community. Um, when you, oh, in, my, in, my, in my time, I've noticed that when we talk about student success in the university and inclusivity, we tend to forget the issue of social class. And it plays a, a very huge role in the success of a student. And I was one of those students who, are, who was affected by who, where I, uh, I'm coming from um, on my studies. Okay, I'm also going to give you a brief um, view of where I'm coming from but I didn't get so many opportunities like over again. Um, in primary school, I'll take you back to primary school. Um, unfortunately, from this point, I don't remember what was happening. I remember being dirty a lot and my mom beating me up because I was <laughs> very naughty. So, um, but from then, the, the, the situation, you could see that um, the standard of learning, you'd si sit in class, write something, color something, then go out and play without really learning something. So that also carried to this, my secondary school um, life where 
I, I was encountered with teachers who had no motivation. We hardly learned anything, and you were not even motivated to do better. And if you do better, it's thumbs up for you. Like they don't, they, they don't tell you, they don't give you um, plans of how you can take what you've done a bit further. So um, it was something. Um, when I was looking back, I remember how we were taught English in Isizulu. Right now, you can tell with my accent that, <laughs> yeah. So it was one of those things. And the fact that we didn't have resources at my school. I remember being um, uh, enrolled the first time. There's a test that we have to, to write when you're doing your first year during the orientation week. It's called AIM. I didn't know a computer could people. So um, <laughs> by the time we wrote the test, I got 9%. Yeah. And to me, that was Pindi Lebaba. You, you, you're not gonna make make it here. You're going to get an SMS tomorrow morning to pack your bags and go back home. But mind you, I have no support, no one in the field already who knows Uguti. After um, writing this test, you can improve. You can actually learn to do better. Already, I was discouraged from the very first week in university. Uh, but I carried on. I didn't. I didn't stop. It didn't stop there. Um, the the. The university teaching style is very different from our high school. Um, you, you're given information to analyze. In high school, you're given information, you cram, you write facts, it's over. Um, for us, they'd say, Guti, you, you learned this information in high school. That time, you were not learning in high school. A teacher would hardly come to class. So you had to up, uh, um, adapt in that, in that regard. So yeah, also, I. We, we, we continued pushing and trying to understand the new concept and trying to adapt um, in the new environment. Now, one might ask Uguti um, how, what pushed me to actually try apply. Mind you, I, I, I had no information about the university system. I didn't know that you can improve your marks afterwards. Um, there are so many people like me back home who don't know anything and uh, for us, metric, that's it. Then you go and work for someone and the poverty cycle continues. So um, what made me, what motivated me the, the most is the fact that I question everything. I started by questioning my environment, my surroundings. I, I, I questioned how I can make it out. Now that I'm at this point, I'm questioning how can I pull everyone else out. Um, there's, there are words from a very wise man. Okay, um, he's one of the Josie uh, members, <laughs> the group, the, the sing, singing group, it, it says it doesn't matter where you're from, but only where you're going, because where you're going is not determined by where you're from. So that keeps me going, and it, it, it allows me to push and try to do better. Now that I know that I'm from this system, and there are many more pe um, students that uh, were in the situation that I was in, in first year, I decided to join Last year, I was a member of the mentorship program that is given by the, provided by the university. And I'm a member of the SRC, and my portfolio is community engagement. We push for, 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 for um, to cover those things that the university or people overlook when we talk about inclusivity. We try to push, um, to give learners um, a simple meal. We push to get um, food for them. Um, and also, I also decided to continue in my academic life, yes. Um, to, I'm doing developmental studies, and my focus is how to improve the um, education system, the public education system in South Africa, so that those that are coming behind me won't uh, experience the very same things that, I'm, that I have experienced before. And it, the, 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 the saying in Zulu of saying, umuntu ngumuntu ngabantu, keeps me going also that I have to look back and help those that are still coming behind me. And since I've learned, those that are coming also will survive, adapt, and also learn now. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Don't mind my voice. I'm very sick today. So yeah, it's hard to speak after these two people. But sometimes when we speak, our deep soap stories, it suddenly feels like we're just seeking public empathy or sympathy. I'm not here for it, so be, be fine. So my name is Stanford. <clears throat> I was born in Pumalang and Bushback Ridge, and I was raised by my mom, a teenage mother, 
that got me when she, while she's still in high school and my grandmother that used to work in a farm. I try to make this short because sometimes it gets emotional. So I'm the firstborn of four boys and not having a father and a mother that's not working because my mom and my grandmother later in life, they got chronic conditions, both of them. So I finished school. Sometimes there wasn't food at home. Sometimes I didn't have shoes. Sometimes I didn't have a school bag. I used to use the text, testic right, uh, rice bag as a school bag. So while I was in primary school, of course I come from a community where there's no electricity, no running water, no education. Everybody drops out in primary school. So I was lucky, although I don't believe in luck, to, be, to go to the University of Limpopo for me, as a township boy, to experience highways and flats, I was like, okay, so there's a world outside my world. And I told my mom, did you know there's a, there's a thing called highway? She's like, what's that? Because we didn't even have TV, so we didn't know what it was. So that's where the fire started burning in me to say, obviously, I'm poor. But if I think that I'm not poor, I can go forward. Okay, let's fast forward. And then went to high school. It was very hard. And then I passed on top of my class with maths and science. And then I went to uni. Because of pressure from friends and family, I thought like over oh, I wanted to start BSc. And then I didn't like science. Um, if you ask me what's my career, it's talking. I like talking. Unfortunately, I have no energy today. So I dropped out because I had to work to provide at home my mom, grandmother, and my brothers. I have three brothers. And then I came back to the uni. Two things. One, I worked in ShopRite, and I had my metric. It's a fancy certificate, most. <laughs> but my boss didn't even have metric. I'm not undermining. But she used to give me instructions in Tswana, and I'm not Tswana. And when I could not understand, she said, Hey, Ustai, allow it, meaning you're stupid. And I was like, how can I be stupid? You don't have metric, but I have. So who's stupid? <laughs> then I also gave myself answers. Why are you here? Mm -hmm. and then I reapplied in UP. Funny enough, I've always loved UP. I don't know why, because it can moor you. <laughs> so I applied in UP, and then I was accepted. I started my degree. Of course, I didn't have money to rent a flat, so I lived in Mawopan, like Oba King, at the relative's house, my aunt's house. And then 18 January, when I'm supposed to register, the husband kicked me out because I wasn't contributing to groceries. And I don't really cry because at a very young age, I told myself to be strong, but sometimes by doing that, you build up emotions. So that night, I cried, and I almost killed myself. And I almost said, let me go home. Can you imagine from Abopan to, to Nelspreit in Bushback Ridge? It's a long way to Frido. So I started uni, first six months, I had my part-time job and things like that. And then, uh, of course, I had 10 modules and a part-time job, making sure that at least I have money to send back home. And it's not very important, but I've got to mention that I only had one pair of shoe that had a hole and people used to laugh, and I don't know why. And then I met a young man called Daniel. Um, I don't know whether you believe in God or not, but I thought he was sent from God. He asked me, do, do you eat, bra? I said, yeah, I do. Everything I do. But I was lying. I wasn't eating. And then he started buying me food from his, because he was living in rest. And then I moved from family to friends, got kicked out. The first six months, I had 10 modules. I failed 50% of them. And I got a letter from UP. I'm sure Prof. Wendy and other UP staff, they know. It says, section blah, blah, blah of the Department of uh, Faculty of Education. If you don't improve, you'll be out for the registrar with a big signature. I saw flames and I was like, but it's not my fault. I don't have resources, I don't have textbooks, I don't even have books to write notes. But for me, that moment again was a wake up call to say, 
But bruh, you can sit down, blame yourself, and cry, and blame government for not giving you money, your parents for not being educated. But you only have you, and honestly, I only have myself, even today. From that moment, and at the same time, I was lucky I got a scholarship for, from Dell Young Leaders. I wrote my exams, I passed, I got the 50%, so I stayed in uni, and then second semester, I got the scholarship, most life is nice. <sighs> and then I passed, and from that moment until now, I'm no longer a 50% student, I get distinctions all the way. So, um, I actually wrote something, but because it's my story, I can't even look at the page because I have a lot of things going on in my mind, which, which parts are important. So what I want to say, and it's unfortunate because I'm speaking to professors and doctors, not high school kids, of which I like doing a lot. Um, in life, you've got to ask questions, like Pindile said. Um, I got to know a student advisor when I was in trouble, and that's the mistake we make a lot, a lot of students make when they get to uni, assuming and thinking that, ah, oh, I'll be all right. Ask questions. And um, you need to work hard. Stop blaming situations because your situation is sometimes deeper than the person next to you. So it's either you wake up, you stand up, and grab all opportunities, I mean, instead of crying, use your situation as a motivation. I always joke around my friends when they say, Hasten, can when are you finishing? Because I've been technically in the uni for eight years, including the years that I dropped out. I always say to them, I'm going to study for my great grandparents as well because they never had opportunity to go to uni. <laughs> so without wasting time, I just want to say that as, as a black poor student, it's all in the mind, the poor. Once you remove it, you unleash power to say, I can be just like anybody. Because I'm telling you, even people that have lots of money have problems. It's just, the problems are different. So I said to myself, I'm gonna do this, I did it, now I'm in fourth year, I'm in the SRC, and recently, I don't know whether Prof. Good is here, I got an opportunity to go to Australia to run a mentorship program that's working with high school kids from Mamelodi campus. I like community work as well. So I'm not going to quote anyone because I think I'm smart enough. Um, <laughs> in life, like I said before, you just have to make your priorities right, work hard, help other people, check your surroundings, look at everything that you see as an asset. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to thank our students. It sort of leaves me speechless. I don't know how one analyzes the depth of the experiences and the depth of the courage and the resilience and what, what they have shown to get where they are today, but they're all successes. <laughs>